Hello, how is everyone today? It's fine. I'm glad you all decided to sit down close because you know we decided not to prep any slides or anything. We're just going to do everything the old-fashioned way. So, um, since the seminar was entitled "Why Do My Ears Ring," I was thinking we might start there. Does anyone here have ringing in their ears? Any sound that's in your ear and not in the environment is considered ringing. Ringing or buzzing or crickets, it can be any number of things. So um, it just depends on how you perceive it. So tinnitus or tinnitus, both of those are correct pronunciations, um, is what you're hearing in the ears. And like I said, some people describe it as cicadas, frying, whooshing, um, you said threshing. Um, like it can a washing machine going over and over. It can be any number of things. <laughs> and so the most common reason that people have ringing in their ears is because they have some decreased hearing. Other major causes can be that you have wax in your ears. Um, you can also have um, tinnitus because of medications that you take. There are things that have been proven to actually make tinnitus, if you already have it, worse. So if you are um, very tired, if you're under a lot of stress, those things can make tinnitus worse. Also, if um, they've also proven that caffeine, alcohol, and salt can make tinnitus worse. So it's not to say that if you eliminate all those things from your life, it's gonna make your tinnitus go away. But generally, those are things that do make it louder, make it more prominent. So the, you can experiment with some of those things. I've had patients tell me, I'm not giving up my coffee. I'd rather have my, my coffee and have some ringing than give up the coffee. Well, you have to make those decisions. You're adults. You can make those decisions for yourself about what works for you in your life and what doesn't. You said three things. Caffeine, salt. Alcohol. So if you notice that you go to a party and you have a glass of wine and the next day your ears ring all day, hmm, <laughs> if you don't normally have that glass of wine, you have to decide the next time, is it worth it or not? So, and only you can make those decisions. You know how much your tinnitus bothers you and how much you can um, handle it and how much you want to handle. I was taking some kind of painkiller. Mm -hmm. And I think it was something like aspirin, but I can't remember the name of it. It started with there, C. And there are several about. pain medications that can cause um, tinnitus. Usually stops when you stop taking the medication, yeah, though. Mm -hmm. well, what about, uh, they tell women, you know, to take uh, a baby aspirin every night. Mm -hmm. And so finally, what is Dr. Oz that said, take two baby aspirins every night. And aspirin? Yeah. Aspirin does cause tinnitus, but only in high doses. So the low dose aspirin that you typically take for your heart, it's not gonna cause tinnitus. So, so usually that's not gonna be um, the culprit. Um, like I said, in most cases, it ends up being that you have some decreased hearing. It doesn't have to be decreased hearing that's actually affecting how well you're understanding. I see plenty of people who I would say have essentially normal hearing, but they have tinnitus and it's because they have some decrease in their hearing in a range that's not really affecting their speech understanding. So, but that's the most common reason that people actually have the tinnitus. Is it normal to have tinnitus like 24 seven? Yes. Like all the time? Yes. And most people find that it bothers them most at night Anybody want to take hazard a guess as to why that is? Because it's quiet. Because you're lying down. Your exactly. You're, it's very quiet. So during the day, you have sounds all around you that help cover up or mask the tinnitus so that you're not hearing it as much. And so it's not as bothersome generally during the day. But a lot of people will tell me, you know, I cannot stand it at night. I can't get to sleep because I hear the sound in my ears doesn't bother me during the day though. If I stop and think about it, then yeah, it's there. But it's at night. So there are several coping strategies you can use, but that's what they are. They're coping strategies. Now, do you usually have it in just one ear? Or both ears? Most people have it in both ears. I guess I'm lucky. <laughs> so um, generally, um, 
coping strategies for it when you're trying to fall asleep would be something like have a fan. Most of our ceiling fans today aren't loud enough, so maybe a box fan or a standalone fan running, or to have a tape playing that they have all kinds of relaxation tapes today that have um, either crickets, so like the forest or the ocean, those things work well. But the best one that's probably sitting on all of your nightstands right now is a radio. Tune it between stations so that you get that white static noise and then you have the volume control and you can turn it to the point that it just is enough that you can get to sleep. And most spouses don't complain about that noise as much as they complain about you having the TV or radio or something else playing in order to try to mask the tinnitus in your ears. So um, that, you, that sounds a little bit more acceptable to most spouses. Now, let me see, did I get through all of your question? Um, I usually clean my ears using hydrogen peroxide or alcohol. Um, but I started having ringing, not ringing, but a sound like a washing machine thrashing around. Um, Dr. Briarly took some wax out of the ear, but I still have the thrashing and beating sound in the same ear that he cleaned. Um, I would recommend that we test the hearing, since it's only on one side, just to make sure that there's not anything out of the ordinary going on with just one ear. So anytime something's going on with just one side of your body, be it your arms and legs, your eyes or ears, we want to check that out and be sure that they're, what the reason is for the difference. So if you are having a ringing in just one ear, I would recommend that we evaluate the hearing just to see if there's anything out of the ordinary going on there. Um, and that way we just know. Is there a cure? No, unfortunately there's not. There's just coping strategies to deal with it and trying to eliminate or cut back on some of those things that we talked about. Also, can, um, if you've damaged your ears when you were younger with mm -hmm. loud noises and stuff, mm -hmm. does that cause tinnitus also? Or? It, because the most common reason for tinnitus is um, hearing, a decrease in hearing, yes. So if you've done something to damage your hearing, for example, you attended a lot of concerts or you worked in a really noisy environment or you did a lot of shooting, then those things are all things that can damage the hearing. And it's that damage to the hearing that actually causes most tinnitus. I'm curious about something. When I was 11 years old, I'm 90 now. When I was 11 years old, I had a really bad infection in this ear. That was back before they had all these miracle drugs and stuff to take. <laughs> and my mother took me to an ear specialist. And the only thing I remember is that they blanched it and drained it. <laughs> I, 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 I was, I was going to spell it out for everybody. <laughs> but anyway, I've had trouble with that ever since. Could this tinnitus be from that that long ago? Or is that? At this point, at this point, 80 years later, it's hard to say. You know, so <laughs> know many, so stretch. many, so many other things have happened yeah. since then. But the common practice that many years ago was to lance the eardrum mm -hmm. if there was an ear infection and if there Can wasn't any. Do that? Generally, no. Mm -hmm. Now, now we have um, some more refined ways to take care of that. So that's, that's why you hear about little kids getting PE tubes, pressure equalization tubes. Right. And they're, the little children what? get tubes in their ears. Oh, uh -huh. You may have heard your um, grandchildren or your great grandchildren have gotten tubes in their ears. That's why. So that they don't have to go through that lancing oh. procedure. <laughs> um, they actually have a little, it's a little tiny, it's about the size of a head of a pen. Mm -hmm. And it's a little tiny tube that they actually place in the ear that lets all that um, fluid drain out mm -hmm. so that they don't have to have their ears lanced repeatedly. It does stay in place mm -hmm. for anywhere from two months to two years. Mm -hmm. And then it actually comes out. If you get an ear infection, then your eardrum might end up looking something like this. This eardrum is bulging. It's about to burst right here at the top. And so what PE tubes do is they just go in and make a controlled rupture. Rather than letting it break wherever it wants to and creating problems down the road, they create a controlled point for it to break. So um, 
this is a hole in the eardrum. This one looks like it was a controlled hole, but I have seen several, of course, in my career of 16 years that haven't been controlled. But this looks like it was actually one that the doctor did on purpose. A um, little more controlled than just lancing the ear, but still done on purpose in the office. Wearing a hearing instrument, if you are a candidate for hearing instruments, um, will help to mask or cover up the tinnitus. And so it does help in those situations where you're a candidate for amplification to go ahead and wear it, at least during the day. The room noises are more audible to you, and so they tend to cover up the ringing in your ears, and they do make it a little bit more livable. You, when you go to bed at night, though, you take your hearing instruments off, and so you're going to encounter the same sort of problem and needing coping strategies probably as you're going to bed. We recommend that you take them out. Your ear needs time to rest, just like the rest of you. I, have any of you ever held your nose and blowed and had your ear, or held your nose to blow and then had your ears pop? Oh yeah. Yeah, pretty much everybody had that happen before. Well, what that's doing, anatomy of the ear. Out here is the ear. Here you see the ear canal. This is the eardrum right here that we've been looking at the pictures of. You have three bones behind the eardrum. You may have heard them referred to as um, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. So this is the hammer, this is the anvil, and that's the stirrup. This bony shaped um, snail, or this bony snail shaped structure, that's the cochlea. That's actually the organ of hearing. And it is filled with fluid. It has little tiny microscopic hairs that stand up inside it. And it's as the fluid brushes past those hairs that those hairs are actually stimulated. They send a signal up the nerve to the brain. And that is actually how we hear and interpret sound, is from that. So isn't it amazing that we can get speech and understanding out of that system? Um, so that's how we hear. And um, I know I had a point. Where was I going? Stop blowing your nose. Blowing your nose. Blowing so they, I'm like, I know I had a point. Um, so the, this tube right here is known as the eustachian tube. You notice that it connects into this middle ear space, but it also connects into the throat. And when you hold your nose and blow, what you're doing is forcing pressure up that eustachian tube into the middle ear space. And so, if you had a weak spot in your eardrum, maybe from a previous um, ear infection where your ear had ruptured or been lanced, um, then you, it is possible that you could actually rupture it again by blowing too hard. Most people, that doesn't happen. And a lot of times, when you're having problems with your ears, it could be recommended by a physician that you hold your nose and blow to help get that eustachian tube working and functioning better. Mm. So um, don't do it unless your doctor recommends it. But Same situation, atmospheric pressure sound. Exactly, plane. going up and down in a plane. You'll notice that eustachian tube, you'll hear the pop. That pop is the eustachian tube opening and closing and equalizing the pressure. Water probably doesn't do much in terms of the eustachian tube other than maybe keep the throat clear. Couldn't hurt anything. Um, so more than anything, swallowing, chewing gum, doing whatever you can to keep the throat as clear as possible so that that eustachian tube will open and close. If that eustachian tube gets covered with mucus or um, isn't able to open and close because there's something, there's swelling or there's something over it, then you're going to have more trouble with the um, going up and down in the plane. Some doctors will also recommend that there are medications that you take, such as um, decongestants, but you need to be careful if you're on any kind of heart medications or anything like that, you can't take decongestants with those. So you want to um, check with your physician before you do anything like that. What about earplugs? Uh, since we're talking about flying, do, mm -hmm. do those help if you put earplugs in your ears? It's not going to change anything because you're still going to have to equalize the pressure between the outside world and your eardrum. Oh. So, and that pressure that's right here in the middle ear space. So, no, earplugs shouldn't change anything at all. What about changes in barometric, barometric pressure? Does that have any effect on tinnitus? Really shouldn't. Now, now having your ears, she said that when fronts come in and her ears stop up, she has some more problems with ringing in her ears. Well, when the fronts come in and your ears stop up, 
Mm. That's that eustachian tube not opening and closing as often as it should, and when you get some negative pressure in the ear, mm. yes, that can affect mm. um, the ringing that you hear in your ears. Mm. If, if I can't tell which ear my tinnitus is in, does that mean it's in both ears or does that mean my brain just can't tell? Probably means it's in both ears. Probably means it's equal and in both ears. What can you do to keep the eustachian tube open? There's really not much you can do. The most, time, most of the times that it's a problem is when you're sick so, or when you have allergies, when you have drainage down the back of your throat. So that post-nasal drip, that, that's what gets that eustachian tube dysfunction, you know, uh, aggravated, makes it not work as well, is having all that stuff draining down the back of your throat. Is it common to have two different types of ringing um, in, a, in your ears? And it can be, it just depends on um, what's going on with the ears. It's not uncommon for it to be different from one side to the other. And one of the th other things about tinnitus that you need to think about is your response to it makes a big difference in how you perceive it and how well you deal with it. So if you perceive it as, ah, there's ringing in my ears, your body is going to start that fight or flight response. And so you're going to have a much more, um, you're gonna be much more reactive to the sound. If you go to the doctor, you come to the audiologist, we check everything out, we can't find anything that's a medical issue, then you know, okay, it's fine. That's just my little friend, Jiminy Cricket, over there. Mm -hmm. And you can start to look at it a different way because your attitude about it and the way that you look at it does make a huge difference in how you deal with it. They have. Have they ever used noise canceling um, headphone technology to try to mask tinnitus? They have. They're not very successful with it. Um, the problem is that they have to match it exactly to the sound in your ear, which is fine if it's a single tone. If it's a complex of tones, it doesn't work very well. And for most people, it is a complex or a thr thrashing or something else. It's not just a single pure tone that they can send in a cancellation tone um, 180 degrees out of phase to take care of. Is there a way to tell what kind of tinnitus you have or how you perceive the sound? And no, because it's a matter of your perception of it. That's what I thought. So I, I can't hear what you hear. So, and just because someone has the same decrease in hearing as someone else, doesn't mean that their tinnitus is gonna be the same. Their tinnitus could be very different, even though their graphs for their hearing are exactly the same, because it's a matter of perception. Does everyone who has hearing loss have tinnitus? Almost everyone who has hearing loss has tinnitus. Those two things are best friends. Where you have tinnitus, you must always have hearing loss. Where you have hearing loss, you must always have tinnitus. The two things go together. The reason that the um, hearing loss tends to cause the ringing is, you remember we talked about this cochlea, that snail-shaped bony structure that's filled with fluid. Well, in there, those little hairs get damaged. And let's see how far they blow the hairs up for us, right here. So you have three hair cells here, and then there's one on the other side. Those little hair cells actually get damaged. And that damage, one of the theories, because all of this is theoretical, but one of the theories is that that damage to that hair, the brain then perceives that hair is always moving, always being stimulated. And so that's why you hear the sound, because that's the way the brain perceives that damaged hair is always being stimulated. Um, they are working on some new medications that are years and years out, but they have figured out how to um, get mice to tell us that they have tinnitus. Um, mice ears and human ears are the closest together, so that's why we have a tendency to experiment on mice when it comes to ears. Um, with the um, mice, what they did is they trained them to go and press a bar every time they heard a high-pitched noise. And then they were very mean to the little guys, and they, at least they sedated them. They sedated them, exposed them to very loud noise for four hours, woke the little guys back up, put them back in their cage, and they just went and pressed the bar, even though 
there, there wasn't any sound present that we could hear. The mice had, then they could prove had tinnitus. So they've started to do experiments with those mice on how to go in and do some um, neurotransmitter receptor kinds of um, medications that may help to eliminate that response that we're getting. Um, but they are years and years and years in the future. They're not even anywhere near um, human trials. So all those things you see on TV or over the counter that say that they can help, they can't really help. And so don't waste your money. The um, question is, if you can hear someone else's headphones, are they too loud? And the answer is, in general, yes. Uh -huh. So. <laughs> <laughs> what I um, my my kids are for the most part grown up now, but the rule that we used to have at our house was if you were sitting five feet away from your sibling and you can hear their um, music, then you get to tell them to, that they have to turn it down. Um, the rule that they're telling kids today, because they listen to their iPods and so much, is they're telling them you, know, you can take the volume control that's on your iPod or your phone, you can put it at 80 percent of the total volume and you can listen for 90 minutes. That's it. Your headphones have to come off after that. If you want to listen longer, then you need to turn the volume down. So that's the rule that they're um, trying to, it's the 80-90 rule is what they're calling it. And that's what they're trying to get um, teenagers today to adhere to. So she has a friend who sneezes that is so loud that it actually hurts her ears when she sneezes. Um, fortunately, there isn't much within the human voice that can get loud enough to actually damage your, okay. your ears. Um, it ha usually has to be amplified or a power tool, guns, um, are really bad about that. She's asking if there's a way that we can control the sound in the environment. And I didn't print this one out for you guys because I didn't know how interested you would be. But what this is, is the ocean noise exposure rates. I think they're a little, um, I don't think they're quite conservative enough. However, what OSHA says in um, somebody's work day, they can be exposed to eight hours of a sound at 90 dB so that that will mean something to you. Up here is a graph. Across the top are the different pitches. Along the side is the loudness. And so you can get an idea. A lawn mower is a loud, low pitch sound. A telephone ringing, depends on the ringer. Um, an old fashioned telephone ringing um, is a loud, high pitched sound. Doesn't matter what the pitch of the sound, it can still cause the same damage to your hearing. Um, but what OSHA is saying is that for eight hours, you can be exposed to something at 90 dB, and that's okay. They're saying that you can only be exposed to 95 dB for four hours. For every five dB you go up, you half the amount of time that you can be around that. So that when you get to um, 110 dB, which is right here, you can only be exposed to that for 30 minutes. So those are the Occupational, Safe, Sa Occupational Health and Safety Commission's um, standards for what has to be protected. So anybody that you look at in terms of the noise around you, if it's not exceeding these OSHA levels, they're not going to be concerned about it. Now fire, firecrackers, uh, you notice firecracker here, it's down off the chart. <laughs> and so this is at about 130, 140 dB. Yes, I have definitely seen people who have decreases in their hearing from being around firecrackers. Why, why do you think that it is that there's so much noise in restaurants and places that we go out to eat today? A lot of the places don't have carpeting. Uh huh. They don't have acoustic tile. Exactly. They don't have carpeting. They don't have acoustic tile. Yeah, and, the and they have loud music in the background. Mm -hmm. And they so want you to. They're striving for that. It, that's exactly what I was going to say. They're striving for that. They want Based you to. All the stereos can. They want you to come enough. in. They want you to eat, and they want you to get out <laughs> so that they can get somebody else at your table. And so, no, they don't want you to sit and relax and chat and have a good time. Exactly. They want you to come eat, pay them, and leave. And so they're not likely to change that atmosphere because it would change their bottom dollar. So, But I get complaints about those types of situations all the time. And it is very difficult 
to hear and understand. Even for someone with um, normal hearing, it's still very difficult to understand in that environment. And once you have some decrease in your hearing, it becomes even more difficult to understand in that type of environment, and it makes it even less enjoyable. She, why is it you can hear the bass, but not the music when her um, neighbor has a party? It's because the bass carries better and further mm -hmm. than the treble does. The reason that the low pitch sounds carry further is because the wavelength, sound is always in the form of a wave, and the wavelength of low pitch sounds is longer. So with a low pitch sound, you get a wave like this. With a high pitch sound, you get a wave like this. And that short wave just doesn't carry as far. Mm -hmm. So what my psychoacoustics teacher then asked us, why is it that our sirens on all of our emergency vehicles are high pitched? <coughs> doesn't make any sense. It doesn't carry as far. We should actually revamp all of our sirens so that they're low pitched, like the horns on the ambulances and fire trucks. And there are countries that have done that. Can you train your mind not to hear your tinnitus or your ringing? Um, you can, you can make it less bothersome, and one of the ways that I've heard of people trying to do that is by um, having a sound that just almost covers up the ringing in their ears, but still leaves it a little bit audible so that the brain can kind of adapt to it, and slowly turning that sound down over the course of several weeks so that their brain can habituate to that sound. It, it works for some people. A few instances of feeling like you could hear your heartbeat in your ears. Well, you can actually, because, where'd my chart go? You can often hear your heartbeat in your ear because there is a major, hmm, I'm not sure it's on this chart, but there is a major um, artery that runs right through this area. And so you can actually sometimes hear your heartbeat in your ears. It's usually more prominent if your ears are plugged up for some reason. You could actually take now and just press in and plug your ears. And if it were quiet enough, you might be able to detect your heartbeat. So when you have a cold and your ears are all stopped up, a lot of times people will say that's when they hear their heartbeat the most. Often when we do a hearing evaluation, people will say that they hear their heartbeat because we've got the headphones on them. And so, yeah, if you close that system off, a lot of times you can hear your heartbeat if it's very, very quiet. Absolutely, hearing loss can be genetic. It just depends on the reason for it. There are disease processes that are definitely genetic, um, otosclerosis, um, others along those lines. There's also just a predisposition to having hearing um, decreases due to loud noise. People with blonde hair and blue eyes, more susceptible to um, noise exposure than people with dark hair and dark eyes in general. So um, they've shown that people who look like me are much more likely to have um, decreases in their hearing from being around loud noise. <laughs> Somebody should have told her that in the 70s. Well, we're a little late on that one. However, going forward, we can make sure that we're all protecting our hearing. And the way that we do that is anytime we're around anything noisy, lawn mower, weed eater, any kind of power tools, if we're still going to concerts, or you can get onto your kids and your grandkids about concerts, loud music, then you want to be protecting your hearing. We already talked about keeping the headphones at a nice volume, but you can also use the traditional earplugs that you're used to seeing, the little push earplugs or the little foam plugs. Whenever you're mowing the lawn, using any kind of power tools, any kind of machinery, um, definitely if you're shooting, if you're going to the firing range. Do different people need different earplugs? Yes, different people need different earplugs because Ear canals are different shapes. They make all kinds of earplugs. I mean, you can see how different the two that I have in my hand are. I have one that, that is, you know, a great big foam cylinder. And then I have one that's a much smaller piece that goes further down in the ear. But at the same time, with this one, it has a big piece of plastic on the end of it. 
And so you'd want to be careful what types of environments you wore this in because you wouldn't want that big piece of plastic to be bumped accidentally. Um, but they make all kinds. So you can go out to the grocery store. The hearing uh, or the um, earplugs are usually in with the eye care stuff and there are going to be all kinds of earplugs up there. When you look at earplugs, they're going to have something on them called an NRR rating. It's probably on the bigger box that I pulled this out of, but I thought I would see if it was on here. Um, they're going to have an NRR rating on them. That's a noise reduction rating. And that's how much they turn the volume down. And so you want to look for that NRR rating and you want it to be a big number. This is one of those cases where bigger is better. So you want it to say 29, 32. You don't want it to say 8. So you want it to have a big number on it. If you can't find anything that's just generic over the counter that you like that works for you, there are custom fit earplugs that you can wear. This is a custom fit sleep plug. It can also be used for noise. So um, this is something that we make an impression of the ear so it's actually molded to your individual ear. They also make one similar to this that has a um, filter on it. And for people who really enjoy music, audiophiles, people who are musicians, they tend to like those better. Because with these traditional earplugs we've been looking at and talking about, what they do, I'll show you one more style here as I talk, what these do is they block out a lot of the low pitched, or I'm sorry, a lot of the high pitched sounds. So they really change the sound quality quite a bit, but the ones with the filters on them don't change the sound quality. They actually only change the volume. And so if you want to listen at the Performing Arts Center in, um, so that you can hear the way things are supposed to sound rather than having a lot of the highs taken out and still getting a lot of the bass because the bass carries further because of the longer wavelength, then um, you might consider a filtered earplug that was custom fit. They are a little bit more expensive because you have to pay for the filter, but that is um, a good option if you really want that clarity that the high pitches have and get a good custom fit that's really going to protect you. What's the cost range on that? The the sleep plugs here are about seventy dollars um, for the set. The um, the custom fit musicians plugs with the filter on them are about one hundred and twenty for the set. Who do you see about the custom ones? Okay. Me. Um, we make impressions of the ears and um, actually order them and they'll be custom fit to your ears. You can do something really unobtrusive like those sleep plugs or you can do something really loud like the um, pink and yellow ones that I showed you and I had those um, when I was doing some construction on a house um, and I wanted to be able to find them if I dropped them and so I made them really loud. So she was using the children's earplugs because her ear canals are really small. And that's fine as long as they um, completely block off the ear canal. So, so the, the sound that you're listening to should get softer when you put them in. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't, then they're not working. What's the difference between coming to ADC and going to some place in a strip mall or that's advertising in the paper or on the television? Um, in general, this isn't 100% true, but in general, it's the training of the person that you're seeing. Um, when Rocky introduced me, you heard her say that I have my um, bachelor's and I also have my master's degree. Um, the standard degree that um, practicing audiologists are coming out of school with now is actually called an AUD. It's a professional doctorate. Um, they go to school now for four years to get their bachelor's and four more years to get that AUD. So the um, difference is the training. Um, as you've seen and heard, I have more knowledge that I like to share than everybody necessarily wants to um, be shared. Um, but it's because of all of that training and all of that background. You know, with someone who has a hearing aid dispensing license, they don't even have to have a degree. They just have to have a license from the state that says, oh, okay, yeah, you know what you're doing. And so all they have to do is pass a test. What, what does AUD mean? 
If you ask me what my letters mean, I'm much better at that one. <laughs> M-A-C-C-C-A, Master of Arts, Clinical Certificate of Competence. And people with an AUD still have to get the um, CCC. So they still have to get the Clinical Certificate of Competence as well. You're not going to find that in a dispenser who, um, who doesn't have the degree. Um, and there are a few good dispensers out there, and there are some audiologists who work in places like that. So you want to be sure that you're talking to someone who's well trained is the key there. Find out what credentials they have. Mm -hmm. Find out what credentials they have and find out how long they've been practicing. What, what he said is um, Consumer Reports did a study on who gets the best results. Someone who goes to a dispensing office or someone who goes to an ENT practice that also has an audiologist. And Consumer Reports said it was the ENT practice who has an audiologist. And I find that to be true in the patients that I see um, because I see people who've had amplification dispensed from all kinds of different places. And they may come to me with problems because they aren't satisfied with where they've been going. And I'll come back and say, you know, I would have done this or I would have done that. Sometimes I see very good things that have happened, but sometimes I don't. When you go to most dispensing offices like that, what you're going to see is a dispenser rather than an audiologist. It's not like getting your eyeglass prescription from your eye doctor and then going to an optical shop to get your glasses. It's not the same thing. There's no kind of insurance that covers hearing aids. Is there? No. That's not true. There are several insurances that cover hearing aids. Really? It's becoming more common, although Medi Medicare does not cover hearing instruments, and I don't foresee that changing in the near future. In general, not always. Can't ever promise always, but in general, they do cover the um, evaluation and the doctor's visit, especially if there's a reason for the visit. You know, if you have tinnitus, that's a reason for a visit. So, Are you covered? Um, in general, yes, they're going to cover both the doctor's visit and the hearing evaluation. And what we try to do, what we what we try to do when we co when we schedule that is if you're coming in for something specific that we know you most likely are going to need to see the doctor, um, we'll go ahead and schedule the hearing test immediately followed by the visit with the doctor, and that way you get both things taken care of right away and without having to wait a long time to do that. So you don't come in and see us and then wait for a week or two to get in with the ENT. You come in, you see us. 30, 45 minutes later, you see the physician, and you get it all taken care of at one time. And that's one of the great things about coming to ADC is that we do coordinate very well with our two ENT doctors. Is there any connection between benign positional vertigo, or BPPV, and tinnitus and hearing loss? Um, first, let me explain what BPPV is. Benign proxismal positional vertigo is dizziness when you move your head. Um, so, this is our, remember our cochlea was here, and you can see these canals back here. They're hard to see, but here they're blown up, and here they're much easier to see. These are the organs of balance. And these organs of balance, there are three semicircular canals. If something breaks loose here, in this bulbous part of the canal, and starts floating around in that canal, it creates dizziness. And that dizziness is activated anytime you move your head quickly or you go you know, up and down quickly. That's usually um, something when they call it a, a loose stone or a loose marble in there. Um, and you've got it rolling around in that canal. And there's something that the doctor can do to try to get that loose piece back into that bulbous part of the canal. There are some maneuvers that the physician can do to try to make that go back where it belongs. Usually resolves on its own, but doctor can help it resolve more um, quickly. There is no connection that I'm aware of between tinnitus, BPPV, and hearing, and hearing loss. There is a connection between hearing loss and tinnitus, but not with the BPPV because BPPV doesn't cha cause any changes to the cochlea. It only changes um, 
what's going on in the semicircular canals. Need to be. Not to say that you have rocks in your head or anything, but that that is often referred to as rocks. We've always thought of it as little rocks or little chips or little pieces. They've actually shown in some of the more recent research, it can be more like threads or strings. And so that's why sometimes it takes so long to resolve because we're not talking about a little tiny chip. We can be talking about a thread that's trying to get back where it belongs. It varies quite a bit from person to person, and they're still, still doing a lot of research on exactly what that is and how it varies and why. That The Epley maneuver is one of the maneuvers to put it back where it belongs. And only if you're having the problem is when you have to have those maneuvers done. Amazingly, it does work if that is what is causing the problem. Mm -hmm. And typically, if you're coming in to see the ENT for dizziness, you're also going to be scheduled for a hearing evaluation um, because it's very often that what affects the semicircular canals, because they share the same fluid as the cochlea, those two things can affect each other, and so you're typically going to be scheduled with us for a hearing evaluation as well. How does the loss of the sense of balance and hearing relate? Well, as we age, for one thing, our balance decreases. So that's one reason for the decrease in balance. But just like all the other systems in the body, the um, semicircular canals that control balance don't work quite as well as the rest of us as we age either. Is everyone destined to have hearing problems? If we live long enough, most of us are going to experience some decrease in hearing. I mean, just as we age, the systems age and they wear out. Our knees start to hurt, our hips start to hurt, our eyes start to not work as well. We start to have heart problems, kidney problems, you know. So that's what I hear a lot is aging is not for sissies. Is there anything we can do to help the sense of balance? Sometimes they will prescribe some physical therapy. The doctors will prescribe some physical therapy for that. Just depends on what they think is causing it. One of the reasons you might hear ringing in your ears but still hear lots of other sounds just fine, you see that typically when we test, we test from 125 hertz out through 8,000 hertz. And if you look here, these are the sounds of speech, and that's basically what we're trying to cover, is we're trying to look at the region of hearing that's important for speech. But the human ear can hear 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So this is only a small selection of what the human ear can actually hear. So your tinnitus might come from pitches out past this, higher, where you can still hear these, okay. Or the reverse, you might have a dip here, but hear those higher pitches just fine. So that's why you might hear the sirens and so forth before other people do. Since the sirens tend to be in here, I would think this area would be okay. And then you might have some decrease in those ultra high pitches, which we don't um, usually test unless we're looking for something, unless there's a reason to be testing them.